Welcome to another episode of Threads of Enlightenment. As usual, you know, I love to um, stop right here. This is my habit and my, my time to get a chance to thank our guests for coming because uh, I feel that they're coming with a couple of things that I personally deem very expensive. Doc. One is time. Very few of us know how to utilize our 24 hours that are given to us per day. You are in a field by which you understand the value of that time. And so I want to thank you so much for coming and spending uh, some time with us, the valuable commodity. The other is your journey. That journey housed who you were and made you the great uh, powerful human spirit that is sitting before us and sharing your wisdom. And so we want to thank you for allowing us an entrance into the journey and get a glimpse of who you are, the power, the great uh, wisdom that is there, but it all came at a cost. And so I always tell people, I would like the story when they introduce them, but I want to talk about the cost. So thank you so much, Don, for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. Thanks for having me. It is my honor. Tell the folks of what you do today. How do you serve others as a result of your journey? I tell people. Well, I am a an emergency room physician, and I've been serving in emergency departments around the greater Orlando area uh, for close to 20 years now. Wow. Um, I lived there, and I worked with many of, uh, which, which hospital are you in? Which system, hospital system? Well, I've actually started out in Jacksonville when I got out of residency. So I had trained in Philadelphia mm -hmm. and then uh, did my residency at SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, okay. New York. Yeah, New and York. And then yeah. afterwards, yeah. And then afterwards, I started in, in Jacksonville and came down to Orlando because one of the mentors that I had when I was in college uh, who was talking to me about getting into medical school and went to the same medical school I did. He was working in a small hospital. And then I found out he was running Florida East's emergency department. So I started with them. And I've worked with the Central Florida Health Alliance, which is now UF. I've yeah. worked with Orlando Health and I've worked with Florida Hospital, that's now Advent Health. So I've been yeah. around the system quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, I worked with um, uh, Florida East. Uh, did some. Um, I worked with uh, uh, assisted living facility, and I would visit your hospital quite often. Uh, I was well mm -hmm. on my uh, schedule, if you if you will. I saw that you did a stand out in um, in Jamaica Queens. I was Queens Village man. Um, oh yeah. So <laughs> yeah, that's where I grew up, and my family grew up coming from um, uh, Guyana. That's where we lived out there in Queens Village. So welcome, Doc. I always tell people that um, life is beautiful. That everyone is given birth from trauma, natural birth is a traumatic situation. I've been there. I've watched um, uh, the birth of my sons and it is a messy, messy, uh, uh, painful uh, situation. And the kids were traumatized. Their mother was traumatized. I was traumatized. I was never the same. And so, but it is a beautiful example of what happens to us in the spiritual realm as well. One must come through from trauma and when we look at that child and we see that uh, life, uh, that new life, if you will, and that is what trauma does, it gives you new life. So talk to us about your family unit. What was it like? It is the space that we first reside for more than a couple of days other than a hospital. We are here in this unit called the family. Uh, what was your like? Well, I can tell you that most of what happened in my lifetime was very atypical. And you get a sense when you're involved in it that this is the way that the rest of the world is. Uh, yeah. But my parents were quite a bit different than most other people that I've met in my lifetime. And I've tried to emulate them a little bit, and I know that I could never live up to them. So I was born from a father who was a dairy farmer in Meridian, Boise, Idaho. And my mother was a 1960s hippie style from San Francisco. <laughs> and so they nice. got married in Idaho with my dad wearing cowboy boots and my mother wearing a mini skirt. <laughs> and so it was quite a bit of transition change from them. So if you ask 
what do you get when you mix together a dairy farmer and a hippie? The answer is complete chaos. <laughs> and so we, my father, he learned a couple of things because in Idaho, out when he was young, had Boise State University, which was only a two year school. And that two year school basically taught you textiles or farming. So you either go to the warehouse manufacturing or you go to the back to the farm and yeah. he had left and joined the navy and this was during the vietnam time so he said that's what he found was a third thing he didn't want to do and he huh. got a job with the phone company and moved us out to uh, the greater new york area so we moved to new jersey uh, in the mm -hmm. bernardsville realm and that was quite a transition change, especially for him. And he would work in New York City in a in AT and T at the time. So yeah, you know, it was a large corporate structure. But he didn't have a degree. He worked with a lot of people who did, and he t he told me most everybody did. And he said the one thing that he wanted for his kids was to have an education, which is what really prompted him to accept the move out to New York. Yeah, And so we had a lot of benefit in that because, you know, he wanted us to learn as much as we could. And so one of the things that he would do is learn himself about historical events or things. And we would come home from school and tell him about the Boston Tea Party. And he'd say, all right, mm -hmm. what is that all about? And we would talk to him about what we had learned and he'd have a map. It was a book map and his glove compartment and he'd pull it yeah. out and look at it and say, well, how far away is Boston? Well, that's four hours of getting the car. Let's go. Nice. You know? And so there was a lot of these historical things, especially around that New York area, Valley yeah. Forge, Washington's headquarters. We'd go look at it nice. and hear the background tours and the inside stories. And I learned really quickly that, that school is not about education, is not about intelligence. Yeah. You know, school is about conformity. And yeah. if you conform to the things that they're looking for, what they tell you, it's almost a regurgitation in some aspects, but it's it's playing a game. Yeah. And if you learn how to play the game functionally, you're going to get through it very easily. And it, the one thing that struck me was knowing more about an historical event than what the teacher knew in reading the yeah. textbook that they read because I had gone to visit it. And yeah. so I learned that a lot of the learning that you do in life is going to come because of what you seek out and what you try to find. And a lot of times on your own time. Yeah. You know, I agree. I'm always yeah. uh, struck by that quote that, you know, knowledge has no hold on a compulsed mind. Right. Yeah. So if, mm -hmm. if knowledge is forced, it just doesn't stick. Yeah. yeah. And I agree. So afterwards, uh, my mother, uh, she wanted to be a nurse initially. Uh, she mm -hmm. started working a little bit with the phone company. But when we moved out to Idaho, she wanted to stay at home. And in doing so, she actually reached out and became a foster mother. And yeah. so we took in kids from the time that they were born to about 18 months of age on average. Mm -hmm. and we had a total of 53 of them from the time that I was five till the wow. time I was 15. Wow. And there was a, another girl who was in my brother's school class when he was in the second grade. And it turned out that she was being abused and her mother had passed away from cancer when she was five years old. So that yeah. in itself was traumatic. And then, yeah. Her father started drinking heavily and there was a lot of other problems that went on with it and she couldn't stay at home anymore. So yeah. she actually came to stay with us until she was 18. And wow. so we had a very dynamic, dynamic uh, environment. Household. Yeah. So as a, as an individual in that dynamic um, environment, uh, Doc, how did you manage yourself as far as an individual within that, that mix of constant movement of um, uh, people that are in and out of your life, if you will, and um, uh, uh, the growing 
family. How did you manage? How did you walk around in that? Well, there was always finding a place, but it was always emphasized to us that we participate. You know, yeah. so we were actively involved in helping out with the kids. You know, if there was a baby in the house at that time, we were actively involved in helping. Uh, there was quite a chore list, as you can imagine. Yeah, you know, yeah. there was a lot of those things were kind of impressed on us. And and then we had our alone time, you know, so we actually yeah. had a basement that was made into a playroom that, you know, had everything that, you know, we wanted. So it was kind of like an escape if you needed it. Yeah. Or you yeah. had the ability to I interact with other people in the house. Yeah. I would say the only part that if I could have changed, you know, we, I went to a school that was, you know, 30 minutes away, which now doesn't seem like anything, but, you yeah. know, it was kind of away from where the other kids were. And there weren't a lot of other kids in the neighborhood. So, you know, we, for the most part, made do just with our direct family. You know, it wasn't yeah, yeah. kind of the block party that a lot of other people have and yeah. going out and socializing that way. Yeah, I I, I agree with you when you, you talk about uh, school as well, when you mentioned previously that um, it is, I think it is part of the programming. We, we, um, we are led, if you will, into the program simulation at when it comes to educational piece uh, at a young age and we call it school and that program simulation they really don't teach they just program you as to this is how you ought to behave and the stuff uh, that they are quote unquote teaching is not necessarily any information that you would really truly need and it's really interesting what we do but once we are programmed there and then we are let loose into the other simulation, if you will, as we move forward in life and college and all that thing, it always takes something, Doc, to jolt us out of the simulation, if you will, to uh, well, I think that uh, there's, snap that. Go ahead. I think that there's purpose to it for sure. And oh, yeah. you know, part of the purpose and what I've tried to pass on to my own kids is that, you know, we have to process information. And mm -hmm. I don't care what job you do, there's going to be information that you don't care for or might not be necessary in yeah. it. You know, what, what's the value of a degree? The value of the degree is knowing that you've got the work ethic and the commitment and that you can process that information, whether it's relevant or not, and be able mm -hmm. to house it to a degree to understand it and modify yeah. it. So, yeah, I think I've always uh, been. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I've always been impressed with, you know, my, my brother actually became an engineer mm -hmm. and, you know, he helps to design helicopters with Sikorsky and yeah. he's the one that, wow. you know, I can go over to his house and he's got a textbook in there and I, I can't even open the thing and read the first paragraph. I have no <laughs> idea what he's talking about, you know, and I was like, yeah. I've my undergraduate degree was in philosophy and I've read some pretty complicated texts. And yeah. I said, when well, I can't even get started on that, that's <laughs> you know, pretty impressive. Yeah, it is. It's, um, it's beautiful how um, we process um, information individually, how one can process certain way and the other can't. And um, it's all good anyway. So here you are, you're growing into this big family. You are learning to participate, if you will, and um, the servant uh, uh, um, model, you're practicing and living in it. And I tell people there's uh, there's the, you talk about the, I look at it this way as far as electrical and uh, life and, and all these things because I was electrical engineer. You have the lab that you go and you practice all uh, the book. I mean, you read the theories and so forth, and then you have the lab where you go and practice. And lab is life where you now have to practice um, the, some of the principles in school that they teach you is cr uh, critical thinking skills and so forth and how to do things like that. But life, when you get out there, you get a chance to really practice that uh, theory to see how it is implemented. So here you are, you're growing up in this household, you are moving through life, you are now heading into college. I want to know, Doc, why did you pick the field that you were ushered into? What was it that um, caused that internal uh, compass to say, yeah, this is where I wanted to go? What was it, if you remember? 
Do you want to know that panic and desperation was the answer? <laughs> I actually I started out uh, wanting to be in the church. I grew up uh, Roman Catholic and mm -hmm. was really kind of pulled uh, towards being a priest for yeah. a large part of the time that I was growing up. And then, you know, I always had the kind of envision of a protector. You yeah. know, so I did a lot of wrestling when I was young and kind of developed that mindset of utilizing it to uh, stand strong, you know, and to be able to protect those. I really, really hated bullying when yeah. I saw it. And so, you know, that's uh, I wanted to become a police officer for a while. And then, mm -hmm. you know, I was good at doing puzzles. So went along the FBI line and. When I was in high school, we had a career fair day and they had an FBI agent. So I, I set up to make sure I went there mm -hmm. and then set the rest of the day around it. Right. So yeah. I wanted to make sure I focused on that. And I walked in, sat down and he says, I'm not sure why I'm here because there's a hiring freeze that's in place until you all are too old to apply. So the only way you really get in is by recruitment. And I'll tell you about what I do though. And mm -hmm. I stood up and walked out and said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I started looking afterwards of what I really wanted to do, I said that I wanted to focus on subject material that I liked, you know, what, mm -hmm. what kind of science classes or English classes are what really struck me the most. And I really had a fondness for my biology teacher and, you know, the ability to understand anatomy, physiology, the mechanism that is humanity, but also just biology and life in general. And yeah. so I wanted to focus on that more. And I ended up going to St. John's University in Queens. And yep. so when I got there, they set up the schedule for the freshman class. Like we didn't get to choose which classes we went to. Mm -hmm. And so they had put me in biology first level. They put me in chemistry first level at a public speaking class. And then I had a philosophy class. And when I showed up to the philosophy class, I didn't know what to expect, but I had a couple of teachers in high school that would talk to me about manipulation of thought and especially mm -hmm. how that happens in the media and yeah. how they'll focus on one thing and make it look great and focus on other things, which kind of diverts our attention and, and what we believe. Yeah. And so I was fascinated by that. And I wanted to know how people thought and especially how they came up with some of the ideas that they did. That, that was <laughs> always really fascinating to me. Yeah. Uh, so I became a fan of like origins of words or phrases, you know, and, and where where the slang might come from. Yeah. Yeah. And I found out that, you know, when you when you look at different slang, it comes from much different places than we think it does. Yeah. You know, and so it almost in some instances changes the meaning and sometimes it doesn't change it at all. Mm -hmm. And so when I got into the philosophy class, the professor walked up and asked a student in there, do you believe in the Bible? Mm -hmm. And the student says, yeah. And he goes, you're an idiot. <laughs> and he went through for the entire hour with proofs yeah. of why the Bible shouldn't be regarded for anything. You know, it, it's modern mythology. It's people desperate for some answer, some solution. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's no basis in in a historical reality or you know provability in it and things like that and yeah and the way he was structuring the proofs you know would sound reasonable and yeah. so i came in for the wednesday class you know on a monday wednesday friday and he walks up and asks another student do you believe in the bible and the kid looks him dead in the eye and says of course not and he goes you're mm -hmm. an idiot and he went on for an hour about how it's the best philosophy ever put down on paper, you know, that it has developed the structure of our civilization in uh -huh. a coded ethical guideline. 
and yeah. how it's kind of antithetical to a lot of what our initial urges would be like for survivability mm -hmm. or, yeah. you know, these kind of things and, and creates an interactivity. You talk about the servitude, you yeah. know, th that's kind of the station and the function there. And yeah. that's even if you don't believe that it's a divinely inspired. <laughs> and so we went through yeah. all these proofs and, and I was like, I am hooked, you know, <laughs> <laughs> how somebody could see things so logically. Yeah with these quote unquote proofs yeah. from the exact opposite standpoint and both of them mm -hmm. sound equally valid, yeah. you know, it just kind of opened up this avenue to me to see things, you know, a little bit differently or, yeah. you know, at least be able to look at things from a different angle. Yeah. And so eventually I got a call because I just kept taking class after class and I got a call from the dean's office, which is usually not good news for me, you know, <laughs> and he sat me down and he said, listen, if you take two more classes, you know, then you're going to have a degree in this, you know, and yeah. I, because I had already established my biology degree. And, and so I was like, well, that's, that's wonderful because I've got three scheduled for next semester. So, you know, <laughs> I don't take care of that. <laughs> and at the end of that, you know, I could tell you where the hamburger came from and I could tell you why. And I'm still yeah. asking, do you want fries with that? Yeah. And had yeah. absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I grew up with a lot of fears, uh, just hesitations, you know, you might call it anxiety, uh, mm -hmm. and then kind of broached into that realm of helplessness. Yeah. And once I did that, I never wanted to feel it again. The second I felt helplessness, you know, I'd, I'd never wanted it. So I was trying to pursue different things that would take away a helpless feeling. You know, where did so you I get started it from that. Where, well, where did you how <laughs> old were you when you picked up that um, that belief, if you will? That uh, feeling of helplessness was when I was 14. Yeah. 14. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, what was, uh, I read what I, what I think, but what caused it and, um, uh, what caused that? And when it entered in, how did you react internally to that? The entrance of that powerful force when it stepped into your life? So what happened was we were actually on our way to church on a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. And it happened to be a rainy Sunday. And I, I remember that it was something that we had changed the schedule for. So we weren't initially going to go. And then we kind of just piled together and got in the car. And we were in a minivan at the time. So this was 1991. And, you know, people plus or minus wear seatbelts. You yeah, know, it wasn't yeah. as required or urged. It, it was encouraged, but it wasn't. Yeah enforced the same way it was. So I could tell you that as we were driving along uh, on a Sunday morning, the biggest event of the week, right, was the Sunday comics. Yeah. And so I was in the middle bench seat in this minivan and I had turned backwards. So I was kneeling backwards and reading the comics that my uncle was looking. So I, I could even tell you the far side cartoon that was in there that morning you know, was wow. uh, the Midvale School for the Gifted, where it says to uh, pull to open and the little kid is pushing on it, you know, <laughs> and uh, yeah. and it was that and Calvin and Hobbes were, you know, the two big ones. So, yeah. Uh, and then it was just a sensation when you start hearing sounds that mm -hmm. you shouldn't be hearing, you know, the tires yeah. squealing yeah. and that crunching metal, that just crushing sound. Yeah, And I just, I, I got a sudden sensation that, you know, you're leaving the seat, you're coming off of the seat. And I saw uh, the handle to the door just smash me right in the middle of the chest. And, you know, you could wow. feel it kind of just pop right there, but yeah. everything's going slow. Uh, my younger sister was in a car seat and I was seeing her with her hair just kind of 
straight up in the air and our hands straight yeah. up in the air because you're looking at the whole thing upside down. Upside down. You know, yeah. and then I came back down to the floor and I just remember dead silence. That's all it was was silence. Yeah. And the windshield wipers that were going and it was pushing the windshield down. So the mm -hmm. windshield just kept crushing further and further down, you know, with the windshield wipers coming and and you know, my father's starting to ask, is everybody okay? And it turned out that there was another car that started to slide and was mm. fishtailing. And she put her hands over her head instead of trying to steer. steer. And that mm -hmm. made her hit our minivan, which cut the entire side of it open and then caught the wow. back bumper, spun us around, and then it rolled and then came back up onto the wheels. And at the time, my uncle was ejected out of the side window and mm -hmm. another car had hit us right after and his head was right by that wheel. Wow. And we, it was one of those things that it's surreal, but it moves all in slow time. Yeah. You know, and yeah. when you look at your parents as your safety and your rock, I remember that was a, that was the first time I ever saw my dad really scared, you know? Yeah. And so he was asking if everybody's okay. And you just hear somebody from the back say, no, you know, and my sister, and this was the girl that my parents were taking care of. Yeah. She leaned up onto that middle row seat yeah. and put her head there. And I could just see the, her face sag down. And then you could see her skull right underneath it. And the wow. back window had gone out and actually just cut her right along the face. And and I remember, you know, that surreal outlook on it of what you understand or what you think about. And so my mother wanted to put pressure on it. And, and so she made me take my shirt off. Yeah. And I remember the prevailing thought that I had at the time was, that's just so not fair. Right. Yeah. It's not fair yeah. that I have to lose my shirt. Right. And, yeah. you know, that was something that that thought line bothered me for a long time. Right. Because it yeah. just, you know, it was like, how how could in a moment like that you be thinking just yeah. about yeah. your shirt, right? and yeah. especially when she was hurt so badly. And it was that feeling of helplessness. You know, it, yeah. it took every fear and anxiety that I ever had in my life and just turned it straight into helpless. And, yeah. So I I know I definitely didn't want to feel like that ever again. And nobody yeah. died in that accident, but it wasn't for a lack of trying, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so once this thing came and um, was in your life and began to um, change you, if you will, and cause you and prompted you to um, change your behavior because you didn't, at this point in time, you don't want any of that. Um, where did it begin to lead you? You were mentioning some of the things you started to, where did it begin to lead you as you began to navigate towards not um, dealing with this particular feeling and allowing it back, um, sense the stage in your thoughts? Yeah, I wanted to find control, you mm -hmm. know, so that I could build up this fearlessness. Yeah. And I think that's that's the way I saw a lot of adults in different situations, you know, and the people who responded and helped out with the car accident, the police officers, mm -hmm. you know, going to the hospital and things like that. I I looked at all those people as fearless, you know. Yeah. And I wanted that. So as I got into high school and then college, I wanted to expand out and just do as much as I could and get a sense of control on everything. So. Yeah. You know, it almost seems like anything that involved the license, I wanted to go get it, go get a motorcycle yeah. license, go get a pilot's license, go get a, you know, whatever it might be, just, you know, go learn as many things as you can get involved in them. Yeah. And I found through that time and then through my career that control is an absolute illusion, you know, yeah. and, yeah. you know, I, I, do some gambling. I, I'm a poker player as well. Yeah. And I always love it when people say that they're not a gambler. Mm -hmm. You know, they could never do that big poker stage because they're not a gambler. And, yeah. you know, I tell them, you, you get into a car, a, a, a small little metal box and hurdle it at 80 miles an hour, less than three <laughs> feet away from 
other metal boxes and that other person could be operating it on alcohol, high on drugs. You have no idea. Yeah. And if you don't think that's a gamble, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how people uh, make statements. And um, I know someone told me, I don't know how to meditate. I've never meditated in my life. And I looked at them and said, that's not true. You think <laughs> about things all day long. You just don't uh, label it meditation. But meditation is something that you must, you you have in your mind and you're rehearsing constantly. And whatever it is, you don't have to cross your legs and, and uh, be in that type of uh, position to be meditating. So I told them, I said, the human being um, is designed to meditate. It's just mm -hmm. what and how you use it uh, that makes a difference. So here you are, Don, a traumatic uh, situation, and it caused you to um, uh, change and address your situation so that you won't uh, feel that, allow that feeling to come in. As you said, you, you wanted to get all the licensures. You got your pilot license. You got all of these things. What started heading you into um, emergency? Because the reason why I want that, because of all the places to see things that are to, to get a witness as to things out of control, what out of control can look like in one's life, or you wanted to gain control. So here you are in, a, in an arena on a daily basis that yep. all you see is stuff happen because of out of people's uh, uh, control. So. How did you head up well, in that I can direction? Tell you, I, I hurtled into it headlong as quickly as I could, you know. So yeah. uh, I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do exactly. And yeah. so I was progressing on towards the degree pathway. But uh, St. John's is a commuter school. They didn't have any dorms. And mm -hmm. most of the students lived in the local area. So either in the greater borough area or out in Long Island. And they tried to beat. Yeah the LIE traffic, you know, so yeah. the campus would become a ghost town after about 4 p.m. And I had an apartment nearby, so I had a lot of extra time. And somebody had told me that you could go get uh, a free EMT license if you volunteered, mm -hmm. you know, so what's that old saying, right? And if it's <laughs> free, give me three, Yeah, you know, <laughs> and so I started out uh, in Long Island in this EMT class. And there was two girls uh, that were in the local area that didn't have a car. And so I was driving them back and forth to the class. And so we, we all learned together. We studied together, yeah. you know, got pretty close and, you know, I, just being in that area in Queens, we went into Jamaica States. Now, you know, yep. there wasn't a lot of, huge allure to it as far as you know you, you weren't the primary responsibility if you were volunteering yeah uh, so it was definitely appreciated and absolutely you know vital but the fire department of new york carried most of the 911 calls mm -hmm. you know and so we would kind of pig piggyback on some of those and add extra assistance you know in the local community and yeah. it started out in southern jamaica queens and mm -hmm. you know for an 18 year old kid that thought he knew everything about life you know as you do yeah. at 18 yeah. i quickly learned that i didn't know anything you know mm -hmm. yeah and it was shortly after i got my license that uh the i had my first multi-casualty incident and mm -hmm. in foch park uh they were having a religious revival and a storm was blowing in and, you know, they had a large group, about 200 people or so, and, and they stayed and prayed instead of going for shelter. Yeah. And the tent collapsed on top of them. Well, you know, all these people trying to get out. Yeah. And it created just a stampede. And one of the first people that I had to take was a youngish woman who had a boot print across her neck. And wow. she had, you know, what we call strider. She was just <clears throat> breathing like yeah. that, you know, and not getting any air in. And, you know, as an EMT, you definitely need a little more advanced skill to be able to deal with that. And yeah, I was looking at it and going, what do I do? And my lieutenant was standing over there and he goes, uh, I'm going to help you out here. Okay. 
uh, there's two pedals. The one on the right's a little thinner. Mm -hmm. I want you to hit that thing and I'll yeah. get her to the hospital. That's what I want you to do. <laughs> that was and some good a advice. Lot of, a lot of New York City is is very compartmentalized as far as you know, you're stationed into smaller sections and zones. Yeah. And in that area, you're less than three minutes away from a level one trauma center anywhere you go. Yeah. You know, so there was a lot of rapid deployment to the hospitals and things, which was beneficial, you know. And then uh, shortly after that, I went to a shooting call at a 7-Eleven. And I remember being terrified, you know, and yeah. and I thought uh, I, I didn't want to go, you know. And yeah. so they told me, hey, you know, it's the safest place in the world now. You know, the only people yeah. with guns there is going to be the cops. Everybody else is gone, <laughs> you know. And we got there and the man was shot in the leg. And I remember looking at it going, where's all the blood, you know? And yeah, yeah. they said, well, you watch too much TV. Don't don't worry about that. Right? <laughs> treat him. And, and they sat there and said that, you know, he, he just was rocking back and forth. I can't believe he shot me. I can't believe he shot me. And yeah. later that night from all the EMS units, there was a total of, you know, 20 some shooting calls. And wow. it was like, they went out and got his brother and his family and friends and everybody had ever met, you know, I mean, they really wow. went after them. And wow. so I, re I remember calling my father up and saying, you know, like the world's ending, we're at war, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and none of them made the news. None of them were reported, you know, yeah. and that really, that struck me. And, and, you know, somebody had told me, well, one, they wouldn't have enough time. And two, a lot of people don't really want to know, you know, the neighborhood that they live in. And a yeah. lot of it has to do with political agenda kind of thing. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. so if there's not a political agenda there, then it's less it's likely to hit the news cycle. Yeah. And so a lot of, you know, my understanding and my beliefs kind of changed. And yeah. And then a couple of months later, uh, out of the two sisters, Barbara uh, was working with me, was essentially my partner. And we got off work at about 11, 11 o'clock at night. And she went back to her apartment and at 1215 or so there was a 911 call and she said somebody was breaking into her place. And then at five o'clock in the morning, there was another 911 call that there was a gunshot and it turned out that she was murdered, you know, uh, at wow. her house that night. And I, I think the police had gone there initially and, and didn't see anything and there was no noise or light or movement. So they thought it was mm -hmm. an unfounded call, you know, and then, um, you know, and then that happened. And so I recycled into that helpless feeling, Yeah, you know, uh, really set me on a downward spiral. And, you know, even later on, I, you know, figured that I wanted to go to medical school and, as I got into medical school, I went through it and did the different rotations and everybody had asked, what do you want to do? What, what, what field are you going into? And I was like, Oh, any field, as long as it's not emergency medicine. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow, man. And so you know? the, and I think it, at one point I wanted to be, you know, in, uh, an OBGYN, you know, yeah. uh, especially being around the babies that I was when I was young. And yeah. then, you know, just the, I had a, a few moments where I would sit and speak with people about life and death and the meaning of it all. And there was a man who came in who said, you know, his wife was dying and we sat and talked and it was well after my shift had ended, you know, and mm -hmm. so we talked all about how long he was married, what he got out of life, what was important or not. And, and I think I was with him, you know, two or three hours after, you know, my shift was over and, and he had come in probably six months later, I think, and, and for a head cold or something, I, mm -hmm. oh, 
sir, so good to see you again. Yeah. And he's like, I, uh, we've never met, you know, wow. he, di he didn't remember me. He didn't remember anything about me. Hmm. And it was kind of in that same time frame that I was walking through a grocery store and this woman stops me and she's like, doc, doc, you know, and she's like, uh, you remember me? I, you <laughs> rushed in, delivered my baby, you know, yeah. when my OB got stuck, you know, you, you came running in there and you helped out and she knew all about me and my kids and actually told yeah. me that she had a picture of me up on her wall at home, Wow, wow. you know? And, you know, it just struck me, what, what kind of doctor do you want to be? Do you want to be there for people's best day of their life? Do you want to be there for yeah. their worst day of their life? You know, and the man didn't remember me because he had blocked out the traumatic event of his yeah. wife dying and didn't want to know yeah. or remember anything about it, you know? Yeah. Um, so they, it, it came down to that philosophical aspect, right? Where I was like, yeah. I don't think I've got the temperament to be telling the same patient to stop smoking and stop drinking for 30 yeah. years, you know, and yeah. never be listened to, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, it's like, I can't tell you what to do with your life. I can't tell you how to live. I can't tell you what's, you know, right or wrong in the whole grander scheme of things. But if I have the ability to say, you're not going to die today, yeah. You know, then that at the end of the day was worth it for me and why I picked emergency medicine again. Wow. That's a, that's a powerful story um, to see what led you there and what kept you there. And um, the fact that uh, you were uh, driven because of this thing. So let me ask you a deeper question, though. This thing is there. How did you overcome it? Here's your partner, your friend. Uh, went through a, a uh, loss of life situation, it comes back. Um, this is a dark space, if you will. It can take you down, as you said, you began to drift away with depression and all the mm -hmm. other things that come up. What were the tools well, think... that you utilized to get you to manage your life um, over this situation? Well, at the time... <laughs> You know, the, I would say that the tools were very fleeting and, yeah. you know, I think a lot of it was I thought that the opposite and the fearlessness came from pure strength. Yeah. And so I wanted to exude strength, if not, you know, have it, which is very problematic. And so a lot of it was to bury it, you know, and one of the things that became hard for me that I really didn't understand is, uh, you know, Barbara's sister that left and, you know, wouldn't answer a phone call and wouldn't reach out or wouldn't talk to me at all and moved yeah. out of the area and stuff like that. And, you know, she was dealing with her own grief and pain, you know, but it, it almost felt like a double hit, you know, when yeah. Yeah. it's like, you know, where you hope for the consolation and things. And, you know, I'd, I, I would call my parents and, and, try to talk to him. And I remember it was right around that time that it was the first time my dad ever said, Hey, I have no idea how to advise you, you know? Yeah. So you're kind of so outside of my realm, you know, that it's yeah. like, you know, get out of it if you can't yeah. handle it or stomach it. But, you know, it, it, to me, it was like any time that you try to quit your, your, snowballing out of it right because yeah. then it just will become a pattern of stopping stopping yeah. you know and <clears throat> what i've come to learn you know is is that life is like surfing right yeah so the first thing you need to know is which way the water is going and the people mm -hmm. who try to fight the water they just drown yeah you know and some people will get up on the board and some people learn to kneel some people stand you know, but the ones who really make the difference are the ones that cut the waves. They like make the real small changes mm -hmm. and cut the water as they go. The, those are the ones that really change everything. Yeah. And I learned that, you know, fearlessness is just not only impossible, but pathologic. Yeah. You know, because fear and pain, the medical service has done a disservice by saying that, you know, if, if things are uncomfortable, then we should just get rid of it. Yeah. You know, that we should ban it out of our lives, suppress it and stuff like that, because 
another thing that I learned is that everything in life comes at a cost, yeah. right? And if you know and pay that cost, everything is great. Mm -hmm. And if you're not paying the cost, then you're going to accrue interest. Yeah. And if you're not paying the cost or accruing interest, that means somebody else is paying for it for you and they will eventually get tired and stop. Yeah. Okay. So that works financially, but it's also emotionally and deals mm -hmm. with everything in your life. So, you know, if, if you get this fear, you get anxiety and you suppress it or you ignore it, you say it's an improper time right now you know, then you're going to accrue interest. And, and when yeah. it does come out, it's going to come out 10 times, 100 times bigger, you know. And the way that I look at it now is that you don't run from fear. You don't run from anxiety and don't necessarily run from pain, right? Yeah. These things are messages. Yeah. And the messages are there to tell you, you know, your cognitive mind, a little bit about what's going on because there's so much that happens behind the scenes, you know, yeah. and these are all indicators. So it's more that you need to learn, you know, what is that feeling mean? And yeah. I still get a feeling of apprehension almost on a daily basis, mm -hmm. you know, and when I'm working, I can get a tingling in the back of your neck and that kind of, you know, anxious feeling that comes up and, and what that means to me now is just slow down and pay attention. You know, yeah. at, at a lot yeah. of times we go fast or we drone through things, but this time stop and pay attention. And yeah. it, it's meaningful, you know, because it's almost never wrong once you yeah. learn how to, you know, pay attention and deal with it. Right. Yeah. It, it's, it's never <clears throat> wrong, Doc, because it is, I think it is the internal compass because I would tell my kids if it feels wrong, it is wrong, and um, we tend to um, we tend to talk it out or 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 talk our way into that mess. And our inside, uh, that other part of us, is screaming. And the only way it could make itself known or voice known, if you will, is through, like you said, your neck, the, the hair in the back of your neck stands up, and it's trying to grab your attention. That um, here. You need to slow down and become more centered or focused or however you want to um, explain it. Uh, but it is very important that we pay attention to that. Because I remember in my case, when I was going through my divorce, I remember this doctor asked me if I wanted medication to numb me. And I looked at him and I was like, what? And he said, yeah, you can get medication so you don't feel any of that. And I looked at him and I said, no, I said, I want to feel this because it'll teach me uh, let, lessons that if I, I need to feel this, <laughs> you know, I need to feel every mi minute of this so that I can learn. I have to learn how to make better choices and all those other things. And, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's really funny what people are doing with their to numb pain and so forth. And as you said, they're doing a disservice, but it's, it's there to, to get a response, something is happening behind the scene, needs your attention, and that's why it's mm -hmm. presented in your in your situation. So here you are, Doc. You are, um, uh, you've learned how to not master it. You've learned how to cooperate with it and work with um, this. Uh, uh, I would uh, say, uh, I would say, incorporated is a, is a great <laughs> phrase on it because, you know, to say that you're a master of it, you know, yeah. is it, it, yeah, that'll humble you very quickly. Oh yeah, quickly. <laughs> um, you know, so you, yeah, <laughs> you've incorporated. Well, one of the, one of the things I learned through medical school too, um, you know, is I guess if I put the philosophy behind it as well, is that there's three separate intelligences that everybody has, and yeah, probably more than three, but three basics, right? And mm -hmm. these things are very separate from each other. You know, mm -hmm. and one intelligence is your cognitive intelligence. Yeah. You know, this is your facts and figures, your knowledge base, so to speak. Um, and you'll know that that cognitive intelligence because you have to train it. Yeah. You know, there's repetition. There's, you know, things that you have to explain, facts and figures that you're going to remember, whatever it might be. And that's going to be your logical side of things. And the second one is a 
is a body intelligence. Yeah. Right. So, and, and they're completely separate, you know? So there's things that you will tell yourself, well, I can handle this. And your body is going to be like, uh, uh-uh, <laughs> nope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and it, it's, it's almost like you don't have control over that. Yeah. Right. One example that I, I give is when you're weightlifting, right? There's something called loading the bar. Mm-hmm. And so if you walk up to a heavy weight and you tell yourself, now I can lift this, I've lifted it a hundred times and you go and lift it, you're going to strip yourself and actually get injured. Yeah. So what they teach you to do is you have to lift the bar just a little bit, not even off the ground, but just give your body the perception that this is a heavy weight and your muscle tone actually changes to yeah. lift it differently. And that's outside of your cognitive mind. Mm-hmm. And there's the autonomic systems, you know, your your fight or flight, your rest and digest, everything else that happens outside of your cognitive mind. Like you can change that a little bit mentally or, you know, with meditation or even, you know, just cerebrally kind of change things. Yeah. But, you know, the, it, it will happen on its own. And even through the exploration of like immune immunology and how your body is fighting off attackers and, you know, different infections all the time, you know, is, is just something that's very outside of your cognitive knowledge base. Yeah. And then the third intelligence is, you know, your, your spirituality, right? Your, Mm -hmm. your innate thing that you can call it intuition. Yeah. You know, one of the biggest ones is like a sense of fairness and justice. Mm-hmm. You know, if if you take a toddler, somebody who's 18 months old, two years old, and you take something away from them, or even if you give a treat to other people, but not to that toddler, they understand the unfairness of it. Yeah. You know, the, it, it's that innate knowledge of that. And so, you know, the, those kind of things are not backed up in society, right? There's nothing in life or in the world that actually proves justice exists or that things are going to be fair, but we all have that innate sense in us, you know, the part of the problem is that spiritual knowledge base is the quietest, right? And you're talking about meditation. That's the one that you have to channel into Mm -hmm. in the quiet and in those, you know, free time of away from all the distractions. Yeah. Your cognitive itself will always be the loudest and try to drive, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then that body intelligence is the quickest to forget, yeah. you know, because there's things like muscle memory, you know, we'll do procedures. Let's say I'm suturing something. I can do mm-hmm. that while thinking about something completely different and yeah. the hands are just taken over, you know, and, and getting the job done and stuff just out of a uh, muscle memory. Yeah. But if you go several months or a year or more without doing it, it's gone, right? You yeah. you've yeah. got to do it more cognitively. And so my outlook on it now is that emotions themselves are just the messages in between. Mm-hmm. You know, and that are communicating between these three different groups that are on their own. And so a lot of it like mm-hmm. fear and anxiety. Anxiety means something is about to change. Yeah. And pain itself means something has. And there's very little change that you can have in your life that doesn't involve some aspect of pain. Yeah. Chronic pain is that something has changed to the point where your body is in a constant fight mode, you know, fight or flight. It's screaming, you know, at all times. So, you know, and and a lot of those emotional states, I think, you know, myself included, you don't listen to the ones when they first come out yeah. and they're a soft, quiet message. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you bury that down, you're going to accrue interest and it'll get louder and louder, you yeah. know, until you have no choice, but to, to pay attention to it. And then a lot of the medical societies have decided if it's uncomfortable, then just get rid of it altogether. Yeah. And, and I think that's, you know, a, a quick step towards a lot of pathology. Yeah, I agree. Um, I've seen, I've been on, I, well, I, I grew up on both ends. I grew up in the church as a pastor. I, I've seen the spiritual aspect of it. I, I was in the healthcare, my mom, nurses, doctors, dentists, all the stuff were in my family. And, um, uh, you know, I did the business side of healthcare because I couldn't, I didn't have the, the, um, 
the courage I would tell people like you guys and what you do. Um, I just didn't want to deal with it. And here you are, guys, we're talking to Doc and um, uh, there's much wisdom that he has. And he's, he began to talk about some of the, um, the awareness that, uh, uh, that we have within us, the different parts of us that we need to be attentive to. And um, you can misinterpret uh, languages there. And so I have someone that understands this, um, this process. And uh, if you guys find yourself where you need some answers, um, we're going to provide all of Doc's information so you can get in touch with him. And uh, he's here to help and to guide you through because uh, we all need someone to guide us sometimes when it gets dark, um, when we get discouraged, when we, are, we lose a, a, a dear friend, as Doc did, in such a traumatic way. He will help walk you through. And sometimes you're just there and not, you don't know. He's still there. <laughs> and so it's not always something dramatic. Sometimes it's just you need someone to talk to about a situation that you may not have someone surrounding you. There are people outside of that that are, uh, are available and are open to you. And I tell people, Doc, you're expanding your team. That's all you are when you get in touch with someone. You're expanding your team, your knowledge. You're expanding your perspective because they will bring different perspective into your space. And those are the things that you will need to escort you into another uh, dimension of your life is a change of perspective. And when you make that, um, when you understand and you understand what's happening, um, a lot of times you need a guide. We call them coaches. You call them all kinds of stuff. But Doc is here to be that part of, uh, for you and available for you. Doc, is there anything else you want to tell the people? We've been on there for about an hour, and I know I want to. Uh, you had a a long shift, and I want to get you into uh, your mode where you get a chance to relax, have your your space, and and um, get into your groove there. So. Is there anything else you want to say to the people? Well, I would just say that the most important thing, regardless of what happens in our life, is that it's all a personal journey, you know, yeah. and the worst thing you can do is try to compare one journey to another or what led one person to another and even necessarily trying to emulate them, you know, mm -hmm. because there's certain things that happen that are a building block. And so some of the techniques that I have are not going to work on, yeah. you know, some other people. And, and, and I can also learn from them. You know, there's yeah. every day we kind of think that, you know, we've learned something and we've kind of gotten to a finish line, but it's a continuous process. Yeah. You know, so just like riding a bike or anything else, when you start to wobble, mm -hmm. the best thing you can do is speed up, yeah. you know, start moving. <laughs> And and it, it just kind of rightens itself, yeah. right? The worst thing in the world is when you stop and mm -hmm. you just freeze. And that's when, you know, panic will start setting in on you, you know. So whatever journey that is that people are on or whatever that they're at, they don't want to, you know, go out and chase somebody else's journey, you know, yeah. but to focus on what their body is telling them or, you know, their mind or even their spirituality and see where that journey is taking them and just learn from the messages of, you know, maybe this isn't right or maybe this is scary, you know, but keep moving, you know, because yep. if you have that purpose in mind, right, we always think the opposite of depression is happiness. It's not. Yep. The opposite of depression is purpose. Yes. You know, so if you have your purpose in mind, that's when you're going to have your destination and whatever pathway you need to get to that destination is the right pathway for you. Absolutely. I agree 100 uh, percent. Find your purpose and become purposeful. I tell people it'll change your life. Again, Doc, thank you so much for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. And I want you to go Absolutely. enjoy your day, man. Enjoy your family. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.